I think this is going to be the end of the lesson, the series on uh, evidences for the Bible. And uh, we have part one and part two, uh, both of which I'm prepared to bring to your attention today. And uh, we'll go back to um, the series on open fellowship come the new year, Lord willing. So today we have part one of the end, which is the resurrection of Jesus. I say it's the end of evidence because... The fact is, you don't need any more evidence <laughs> than what God has already given in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the end of evidences. I mean, there, there is no... Uh, if you're concerned about, you know, how old the earth is, or whether the Red Sea can be parted, or whether the walls of Jericho can fall, um, you know, those are pretty small compared to resurrection from the dead. So I think studying the resurrection of the dead is, or the resurrection of Jesus is probably the single most important thing that we can do in the field of evidences. In, in Acts 17, God has... Uh, furnished proof. Sorry, I'm looking and it looks like the slide is crazy somehow. <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> I don't know what happened to the slide. Sorry. Um, I, I don't know what to tell you about that. But uh, it is Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, where Paul speaks to the Greeks in Athens who do not know God and tells them the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. That's what it says. Like I said, this is very odd, isn't it? I, I wonder why. I can't even begin to think what happened here. But anyway, uh, it, the, point, the two points here are that God has given assurance to all, by, and secondly, by means of raising him from the dead. When we say he has given assurance to all, you know, this is frequently rendered uh, differently, as in he has furnished proof. And uh, the, the word for assurance or proof is actually the word that is, every other time it appears, translated faith. <laughs> he has given faith to all. As in, we can trust him, we can believe this, by raising him from the dead. And uh, when we say he's, he's produced this, or, or handed this over to us, he's furnished for us the ability to believe by raising him from the dead. So this is the evidence that is necessary to be able to trust him. This is the thing that will make a Christian And so, you know, it's one of those where you kind of, the light just comes on saying, oh, actually, God already took care of this problem. If you're thinking about what's, where's the proof? Well, God provided the proof. The resurrected Jesus is the proof. That's the idea. So, um, let's look at the proof. Wow. All the slides are kind of crazy. Well, we'll do the best that we can. I have no idea what happened to these slides. <laughs> um, we'll do the best that we can. Um, the resurrected Jesus, though, did appear to hundreds of people who actually knew him. And uh, this is the thing about the resurrection. 
you got to understand that, in fact, when we say he was raised from the dead, it's not a uh, thing that was claimed by somebody who came afterward. It's not a thing that was claimed by a handful of people off in the corner or hiding out in a fortress somewhere. It is the case that hundreds of people who knew him uh, during his lifetime, during his teaching, who followed him, were able to verify that indeed they saw him after his death, resurrected. It's not the kind of thing that God expects you, you know, just to believe, if you will, without any kind of evidence. But he has provided very clear eyewitness accounts from very believable eyewitnesses. So 1 Corinthians 5, verses 3 through 8, I deliver to you as of first importance what I received. This is also a theme in 1 Corinthians, by the way. That he's always handing us what was given to him. <laughs> it's not original with him. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, as in it was written that this would happen. Isaiah 53 is a prime example. He was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Also true that the writings point to three days as the time frame. Jonah is a prime example. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Well, Cephas is the name for Peter. And uh, the twelve, the, as in the rest of the apostles who knew him. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Most of whom were still alive, though some of them have fallen asleep, which is to say passed away. Then he appeared to James, which is his brother. Then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So we have an indication that Peter and the twelve, who clearly knew him, saw him. 500 brethren saw him, many of whom remained alive for decades after this event. Then his brother James saw him, and Paul himself saw him. Was Paul in Jerusalem? Yeah, he was. He probably saw Jesus prior to his death. He did not obviously agree with it. He started out persecuting the church, but he was there. So let's look at these witnesses. Uh, <laughs> yeah, his immediate family is the first thing that we take note of when you're talking about is somebody alive or dead? And we believe that he is dead, but there are people who say he is alive, and those people are his immediate family. Well, that's a different story, isn't it? In Matthew 13, verse 55, the, when the, the Lord came back to his hometown and was preaching with authority, they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother named Mary, and aren't his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Judas, you know, is uh, Greek for Judah, and for some reason I, that I don't understand, um, the translators decided to make it into Jude when it came to the letter of the New Testament from Jude, but they actually are all the same word. Judah, Judas, and Jude are the same word in Greek. I do not know why they elected to translate it in different ways. So yes, the Judas who uh, betrayed Jesus is actually named Judah. One of the, and the Jude who wrote the letter of Jude, there right before the revelation, is in fact named Judah. And he is 
one of the Lord's brothers. It says, aren't his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judah? Yes, they are. James, by the way, is Jacob. They translated it James. I'm not 100% sure why, but I think it was to ingratiate the king. You have perhaps in your studies of English heard of Jacobian England, which referred to the reign of King James. Because James is supposed to be uh, Jacob. That's also why if you take a Spanish class and <laughs> they tell you that James is translate, uh, translated Santiago, that's because he's Saint, he's Saint Yaakov, he's Saint Jacob, Santiago. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's also why Shakespeare's evil character is named Iago. Anyway, so James, Joseph, Simeon, Judah, in Acts 1, verse 14, or in 14, whatever that says. I don't know what that is. I don't know what's happening. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So we learn early what his brother's names are and Mary, which is Miriam, by the way. Um, and then we learn that after his resurrection, before the Pentecost has come, his mother and his brothers are together with the apostles. So they have decided to believe in him, where we know that during his time on earth they did not. But they came to believe in him after his resurrection. Galatians 1.19 tells you that the apostle Paul himself said, I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother when he went up to Jerusalem. Again, James is the Lord's brother. We read that back there in Matthew. And we also know that he has other brothers, including someone named Simon and someone named Judah. Well, Jude is Judah, is Judas, but Judah wrote Jude, Jude 1, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now that is a wonderful thing that he has done, but you can see, if he's the brother of James, well, he's also the brother of the Lord. But he won't call himself a brother of Jesus Christ. He calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So that is a, a very neat thing. But my point of the, in this is that if somebody knows their brother, I mean, would you recognize your brother? If he, if people said he was dead, but you actually saw him, had a conversation with him, maybe even gave him a hug, shook hands, whatever, would, would you know your brother? Would you know your son, <clears throat> even if people said he was dead, if, if he appeared to you again, if you thought he was dead, but he's standing in front of you, would you recognize him? You know, that's what we're getting at. This is no small thing. Obviously, these are valid witnesses. <laughs> these are very good witnesses. They obviously know him. They know him quite well. They recognize him and his features having known him all of their lives and sharing some of his physical attributes themselves, they would recognize it. The other witnesses that were mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15 include the apostles themselves. And I'd like to look at John first. In John 1, um, in the Gospel of John, the apostle John wrote in the 14th verse, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That means pitched a tent among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. But 
This John said, The word that was God became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen that glory. In his first letter, verses 1 through 3, he said that which was from the beginning, the word of John 1, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made clear or manifest, obvious. We have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. So back to the first verse, which is, again is kind of messed up on the slides, but John said, we have seen this with our eyes. We have looked upon. It's in, you know, had time to, to observe. And touched with our hands. <clears throat> so John is also saying that he is a valid eyewitness. Not just somebody who saw Jesus in concert in uh, San Diego or something. No, uh, he knew this man quite well. He was with him. He worked alongside him. He listened to him. He ate with him. He touched him with his hands. I mean, he knew this man. That's the point. And that in him was life. And life was made clear to us through him. And we proclaim that to you so that you can be with us in being friends to God. The door is tricky, sorry. <laughs> so, the other apostle that I would look at is Peter, and this is Acts chapter 4, not Merp 20, but Acts chapter 4, 20. Uh, and it's where Peter said, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. There was a time when the ruling class saw fit to punish the apostles for teaching in the name of Jesus of resurrection from the dead. And they told them, stop doing that. And Peter's response was this, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. This is, what does that mean? He said, it's the truth. That's all he's saying. This is what we have seen. This is what we have heard. I knew this man. I saw him die. And I saw him after that too. He's resurrected. This is just the truth. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So I, I, you don't have to like it, and I don't have to like it, but this is the truth of what we saw. But that's all he's saying. In 2 Peter, the apostle also said, in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 16, we were eyewitnesses. We did not follow cleverly devised myths in making known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Specifically, he's talking, I understand, about the trans, uh, transfiguration, what it's called. But the point stands that, yes, he also knew Jesus in the flesh. They, they, they were well familiar with him. So these are valid witnesses as well. The men who traveled and worked with him for years. We have as well other disciples, such as Mary Magdalene, the first to see Jesus after the resurrection in John chapter 20. Is where that account is found. And in case you had not heard, um, as I had not heard when Andrew explained it, 
uh, the uh, the song whose name, of course, I can't remember, but it's Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me, because <laughs> Andy's a nice guy. No, uh, I don't remember the name of the song, but anyway, that song is supposed to be, if you will, what Mary would say when she saw Jesus in the resurrected Jesus in the garden. That's what that song is about. Um, I think people have been troubled by a lot of the words of that song unnecessarily. It's perfectly good. Um, we join with Mary Magdalene in rejoicing that she has seen the risen Lord. That's good. But uh, John 20, 11, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. This is the first day of the week. He's resurrected, but they don't know it yet. She turned around, verse 14, and saw Jesus standing there, but didn't realize that it was him. Um, could be a lot of reasons. People say, well, see, he, she didn't recognize him. Well, for one thing, that's not what you expect when you saw him die. <laughs> for another thing, she's been crying, so she may not have clear vision at the moment. But he did speak to her in 16. Mary, and she turned to him and said in the native tongue, Rabboni, which means teacher. So when he, when he addressed her by name, she recognized him and realized it is him. That's not what she was expecting. But she should have been expecting it. Just like every one of us, but nobody did. No eye has not seen, ear has not heard. <laughs> he said to her, Do not cling to me, or do not touch me, actually, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Okay, so this is the first part of the evidences. But Mary also was one who had washed his feet, you may recall, who had traveled with them and was one of the women who provided for the needs of the company that were traveling with Jesus. There, the women were, you know, doing whatever things they could do to bring food, to... Uh, bring clothing to organize the things that they were being that they were being used to do as recorded in the Gospels. She was one of those who was there in her role while working alongside them and she also she is the first to see him and she you know very believably did not at first recognize that it was him as we said before she'd been crying you're not expecting this it was still dark all these things that would mean, yeah, maybe at first you don't realize what's happening, but it's when he speaks to her, she knows it's him. So we have his brothers, um, you know, we have his mother, we have those that worked alongside him closely. Uh, and hundreds of those who were part of this in some way, who were traveling with them, who were, you know, listening to the teaching of Jesus. There's every reason to accept their testimony that he's alive. Um, you know, how do you deal with that? How do you explain that? That's a different matter. The fact is, all these people from different walks of life with different goals and different perspectives are completely valid witnesses and with one accord testify that Jesus is resurrected. The word witness in Greek is martyr. Now in English when we say martyr we mean somebody who's dying for a cause. but that's a misnomer, which came from Stephen, who is said to be my faithful witness or a martyr, right? And we think, well, he died for the Lord. Yes, but actually he saw the Lord standing at the right hand of God and said, I see him. 
That's what we mean. He actually witnessed Jesus from heaven the same as Paul had done, or would do, I guess, in the next chapter or two. Um, he's a witness. These people saw this, reliably saw this. They knew him. They knew about him. Some of them knew him very, very well. They were his siblings. There's every reason to believe this testimony. Now in Acts 17 again, we close in this envelope structure. Paul said, the Lord furnished proof to everybody by raising Jesus from the dead. But they, on hearing of the resurrection of the dead, mocked. Others said, we'll hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed. And this is where I, I will leave it with you for, this is part one, I'll leave this with you for now because there is nothing else to say. You see what Paul did? There is a God whom you have not known. You should not think that he is worshipped in these ways. Yes, until now, you have been allowed to live and not called into account but he calls everyone to repentance and he will judge the world and it will be fair. And the proof for this is that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. When some of them heard that and mocked him and others deferred or put it off, he went out from their midst. He didn't stop and say, well, now let me bring you this brother who is a, a, a PhD in biology, right? Let me bring you this, this uh, man who is an excellent rhetorician. And he didn't bring anything else because there is nothing else. That's the truth. That's all of the truth. These witnesses are sound, as sound as anything could be. So if you're not accepting that, well, there's nothing else to say. But I'm afraid that too often evidences are supposed to convince people who have already heard about the resurrection and, and decided that they're not going to listen to it. No, that's not possible. I won't believe that. Well, there's nothing else we can do. Read the Bible for yourself. See that God wrote this and that it's an amazing thing. You know, look at the miracles that Jesus did. Look at the testimony of the faithful witnesses, actual witnesses who saw that, right? You and I are witnesses of nothing. We've seen nothing. We were not alive at that time. And if these things do not suffice, then nothing suffices. The whole idea of going down the path, you know, showing where uh, science, uh, archaeology, history, whatever it is, somehow uh, agrees with the Bible, corroborates it, you know, validates it, whatever. That whole enterprise is a mistake from the beginning. Because God has provided the proof. This is the proof. And we're back to what Jesus said in Luke uh, 16, 17, one of those. Um, you know, let them hear Moses and the prophets. If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe though one were to rise from the dead. That is true. The whole idea of going down the path of evidences is a mistake. You don't need those things. There are evidences. And it's reasonable, reasonable to ask for evidence, but God has supplied the evidence in the resurrection of Jesus and in the word itself and in the miracles that he did. So these are the things to think on for a moment. Um, Lord willing, we'll talk about the rest of this this evening. And... Um, 
you know, I say these things, and I guess I'm a little polemical about the evidences because I think that they're harming the church. I think they're harming Christians, and they're harming the faith that we should have. So I don't want to be too hard about it, but I do see that it's doing a lot of harm, and I want that to stop, <laughs> at least to the best of my ability, I would encourage you to put your faith in God and in his word um, instead of having that need for some kind of other method of evidence. Um, that being said, I think the overall picture here is, is very positive. That Jesus is resurrected from the dead. And with that being so, there are many things that come with that. You know, his resurrection is our resurrection. And in the simplest sense, um, you know, we were saying that the age of the earth or the splitting the Red Sea or the, the walls of Jericho coming down are rather small things compared to being raised from the dead, especially after that kind of a death in that day and age. Um, they are small things. The resurrection of the dead is also much greater than what it would take for you to be right with God. And I think that's the real point. You can do right. You can be forgiven. You can be saved in the last day. With the help of God, the grace of God, yes. Forgiveness of God in your life, but he answers prayers. Jesus is our mediator who has suffered everything, including death, for you and for me. So the resurrection of Jesus is very important because it's our resurrection. The, you know, our tendency to think, well, I'm a pretty bad person, or I've done too much, or there's no, no, no hope for me. Mm, you shouldn't think that way. Maybe in human ways, or human minds, uh, philosophy, science, whatever, it's not possible. That, that's fair. But nothing's impossible with God. He raises the dead. You know, helping you get over some problem in your life is, is not going to be too hard for God. He can do that. You can be saved. You can be forgiven. God glorifies his name by saving us. <laughs> It'd be no glory to him if we couldn't get there, if we couldn't make it. That would show that he wasn't powerful. That's not the case. He is powerful. He knows how to help us. He knows what we are suffering because his son suffered. So I would take the message, the message of hope. I realize I've been a little bit hard on the evidence side of it, but the message of hope, I think, is a very good one. And I'm afraid that it gets drowned by the other things, and I'd like that to stop. So, anyway... We'll come back together, the Lord willing, and talk about the rest of this. Today, are you a Christian, a child of God? It's time to obey the gospel. You realize that your situation is dire, that you need forgiveness. There is a judgment day coming, as we read in Acts 17. God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. Today, if you are not a Christian, become a Christian to obtain for yourself forgiveness of sins. Through the blood of Christ that washes away every sin. We will help you to be baptized in his name for the forgiveness of your sins, which will make you a Christian. You become a Christian and obtain for yourself forgiveness. If today, as a Christian, you have not lived right, let us pray for you that you might be restored to him, that you might find genuine repentance and uh, a uh, ability to, to continue standing um, and, and be stalwart in the Lord from this point forward. And that we also may not be tempted and that we may be strengthened by your example. Let's encourage one another on to heaven in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. As much as I love you and I trust everybody in here, I would trust you with my life. I, I don't put my trust in you. I put my trust in Jesus. But let us trust in God that, yeah, we can help each other. We can make it to heaven. We can be forgiven. He can raise the dead. This is no problem. 
If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known, please, by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. 